Caitlin, come back. A blessed good morning, church. And for all those who are listening virtually, we pray that as we worship God together, our hearts indeed will be touched as we've gathered because we desire to learn about our Lord Jesus Christ. We desire to serve him because he's called us into his service. I've got a number of announcements that, um, so if you'd bear with me. If you look at the bulletin, there are many names there that need our prayers. I'd like for you to add to that list our brother Godfrey Pinda, who is not well. Also, our condolences go out to Sister Jenny Demerit and family on the passing of her mother. Also, there's an error in the announcement. The error, the announcement says, ladies, ladies, ladies. The dates are a little confusing. Okay, so the dates for rehearsal are May the 3rd and not Wednesday coming. May the 3rd, May the 8th, and May the 11th. So please keep that in mind because Barry Newbel would like to have as many as possible because you know how the ladies like to beat the men on, men's, on Father's Day. So some mothers, you'd better show up if you want to make an impression. Okay, so ladies, you're warned now the 3rd, the 8th, and the 11th. Also, we'd like to thank the ladies that have been doing such a magnificent job over the past just a year plus. 
down here in Eppethal with decorating. The decorating committee has done a wonderful job and we do want to thank them. If anyone would like to donate flowers, please see Anne Lever and make arrangements with her so that everything will go well. Also too, next Sunday there will be a flyer in the bulletin for conference t-shirts that will be available. Okay, conference t-shirts are available to order next week. Also, our congratulations go out to Brother John Philpott, who has been recognized by the years of scouting in the Bahamas. Congratulations, Brother John. We give you thanks for all the years that you've served. Also to our birthdays, but before I make that, don't forget the cake sale. There's no, there's no notice in the bulletin, but I have a note made here. Don't forget the cake sale. You can get your dessert after church, right over at the front entrance into the auditorium, okay? Um, our birthday greetings go out to Jordan Lockhart, Helen Johnson, Christine Woodman, and all others who are celebrating birthdays this week. So let's sing for them. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. I'd like for you to stand now as we go to our responsive reading. We gather for worship this morning because Christ has come to us. As Christ saw his disciples, so he sees us where we are. Open our hearts this morning to receive your restoring grace. Help us to see you, feel your love with us. May we commune with you as your disciples did at the seashore. Amen. Number 208, the day of resurrection.
please remain standing for our affirmation. I believe in God, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived in the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. You may be seated. Our chorus is because he lives before the pastoral prayer. that over again please because he lives I can face tomorrow because he lives all there is gone because I know I know he holds a Let us pray. Almighty God, our Father, we've come this morning thankful, grateful for your touch on our lives that has enabled us to be present this morning. And yet, some of us come with burdens, heartaches, trials, and tribulations. And we pray, dear God, that your touch, which still has its ancient power, will touch at the point of need for each person, whether in person or listening virtually. For we know that you hear and answer prayers, realizing that we live in a world that is becoming very dark. And yet you are the light in Jesus Christ. For he says, I am the light of the world. So no matter how the darkness tries to crowd in on us, with your light in our lives, we can 
dispel the darkness that would overtake us. And so this morning, dear God, we present ourselves anew to you, asking you to work in us, work through us, mold and fashion us into what you would have us be. That our minds and our desires will be done away with. That your desire for our lives will become prominent, will take first place in our lives as we work for you in a world in which you have placed us, placed us here for worship to you. And yet we'd wandered away, but your call came back to each one who has answered that call to come to follow. And if we are indeed following you, then we are your disciples. And Jesus said, you are my disciples if you do whatsoever I command you. For we have that promise that no matter how difficult a road may seem, his promise is that he will be with us. He will guide and direct us. And so, Heavenly Father, as we continue in this service today, we pray for our pastor, Reverend Lightburn, that you will so empower him that the words you've given him might be challenging to us, that we might be equipped to leave this place, for we have a week ahead of us, and we don't know what lies ahead of us, but we know that our God lies ahead of us. He goes before us. He prepares the way. So let our eyes be open to see the way that he has prepared for us and follow in that path. These mercies and prayers we ask in no other name but in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, our blessed Savior. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Let us turn in our hymn book now to number 207, 207, and after singing this, uh, Ms. Ashley Humes will offer our, our prayer. Our offering will be received, 207, Christ the Lord is risen again, hallelujah.
Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, you are an abundant God, and out of your great mercy, you have given so much. We give you this offering today. With it, we worship you and give ourselves to you. Please now take and use it for your kingdom and glory. Amen. Amen. Mrs. Sophia Wilkinson will come now with our first scripture reading. Good morning, church. Good morning. The first scripture reading is taken from Isaiah 25, verse 4 to 7. For thou hast been a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shadow from the heat. When the blast of the terrible ones is as a storm against the wall, thou shalt bring down the noise of strangers as the heat in a dry place. Even the heat with the shadow of a cloud, the branch of the terrible ones shall be brought low. And in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all, all people a feast of fat things, a feast of wine on the lees, of fat things full of marrow, of wine on the leaves, well refined. And he will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all people, and the veil that is spread over all nations. Here ends the reading of the word. At this time, the choir will render a selection after which Ms. Charlene Bucci will read our second lesson for us. Jesus, we exalt 
Scripture is taken from Mark 21, verses 1 to 14, and I am reading today from the Good News Bible. It's the English version. After this, Jesus appeared once more to his disciples at Lake Tiberias. It has now happened, Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel, the one from Cain and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples of Jesus were all together. Simon Peter said to the others, I am going fishing. Will we come with you? They told him, so they went out in a boat, but all that night they did not catch a thing. As the sun was rising, Jesus stood at the edge of water, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then he asked them, young men, have you caught anything? Not a thing, they answered. He said to them, throw your net out on the right side of the boat and you will catch some. So they threw the net out and could not pull it back in because they had caught so many fish. The disciples who Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Peter heard that it was the Lord, he wrapped his outer garments around him for he had taken his clothes off and jumped into the water. The other disciples came to the shore in the boat, pulling the net full of fish. They were not very far from land, but a hundred yards away. When they stepped ashore, they saw a coal fire where there was fish on it and some bread. Then Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. Simon Peter went abroad and dragged the net ashore, full of fish, a hundred and fifty-three in all. Even though there were so many, still the net did not tear. And Jesus said to them, come and eat. None of the disciples dare ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. So Jesus went over, took the bread, gave it to them. He did the same with the fish. This then was the third time Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was risen from the dead. Thanks be to God for his holy word. Amen. I'd like to thank all of those who have taken part in this service today to make it what it is. That means everyone from the ushers coming in to the stewards, the musicians, and you and the choir and the controller of the sound system. We do thank all of you because you help make this service the possible for it to be broadcast that others will hear. We'd like to welcome Pastor Lewis and Sister Ruth in our midst today. We're glad to have you with us today and we pray that you will be blessed as your time with us. 
Also, I understand Reverend Cunningham and his wife. Oh, right there, okay. We're glad to have, have all of you here today. Okay, let us turn now to number 216. 216, Jesus lives. 216, Jesus lives thy terrors now. Hallelujah. And to that I say, Amen, Amen, and Amen. The joy is mine to join with our worship leader, Mr. Percy Sands, in extending a very warm, loving, and gracious welcome to all worshiping with us this morning, whether virtually or you are in person. It is always a joy and delight to have you and to share these moments of fellowship together. And I want to thank you, each of you, all of you, for the contribution that you have made to this worship experience this morning. Thank you for your faithfulness week after week in being here. And I just want to drop a little hint that we're getting closer and closer to home. Okay? So hang in there. We'll get there. But again, we're grateful for your presence week after week and all of your support by prayers and gifts thus far. And we pray God's richest blessings upon you all. Breakfast with Christ on the beach. Breakfast with Christ on the beach. Please join me as we pray God's blessing on these moments of meditation. We have sensed your presence, loving Lord, 
as we have come together for worship this morning. And we thank you that you have honored us yet one more time as you have inhabited the praises of your people. Be with us now in these moments of shared fellowship around your word. May the words of my mouth and the thoughts of our hearts be acceptable in your sight through the one who has made it all possible, even Jesus our Lord. Amen. St. John in his Gospel records four appearances by Jesus following his resurrection. This appearance here in John 21 is the last of the four. This chapter, interestingly, is the last recorded miracle of our Lord. And it's the only miracle recorded after his resurrection. This miracle takes place among seven of our Lord's disciples who had left Jerusalem and returned to the Galilee. It's a very moving and touching experience because it gives us some wonderful insights into the risen Lord's relationship with his disciples. And so I invite you now to consider with me this account of Jesus having a breakfast of bread and fish with his disciples on the shore of Galilee. And as we seek to work our way through the passage this morning, I want to just lift three points given to us by John the Apostle. First of all, I want you to notice the risen Christ sought his disciples. The risen Christ sought his disciples. Our Lord's disciples were last seen locked away in Jerusalem because of fear. But now we find them far away from the city in the area of the Sea of Galilee, a place very familiar to them. Because of the fear of being discovered and persecuted, they decided to leave the Jerusalem scene. For you see, a lot was still going on, a lot was still happening. And it had been rumored that the disciples had come and had removed the Lord's body. So it was still not a safe place to be for them. It would have taken these disciples a day or two to actually travel from Jerusalem to Galilee. And once they arrived, they immediately began making plans to go back to fishing, which would have been their former occupation. The nets, which had been cleaned and put away, were taken out once again. The fishing boats, which had been beached, were put back in the sea, with all the fishing gear inside of it. Things just didn't seem to work out with this Jesus of Nazareth. So it was time to go back to what they knew and to what they were capable of doing, fishing. And after everything was ready, they launched out into the deep in the evening as they had done many times previously when they were fishing. Perhaps they went to the area where the fish were known to be. And there they threw their nets 
and drew them in and threw them out and drew them back in time and time again, but caught absolutely nothing. They went to another area, and the same thing happened. And how totally frustrating and discouraging it must have been. Those nagging feelings of failure began to gnaw at them again. We have given and done our best. And yet again, we've come up very short. So discouragement began to set in. In June of 2006, Linda, Curtis, and I were on a month of ministry trip to the Methodist Church in Spanish Wells. A few days after our arrival, Curtis, our son, who would have been between seven and eight at that time, had heard about all the good fishing that takes place in the Bahamas, so he wanted to give it a try. And so on Thursday evening, I took him down to Mr. Pindus Dock to do some fishing. He fished for about 30 minutes, and he didn't get a bite. And I could sense that he was getting frustrated and somewhat discouraged. He turned to me and said, Dad, let's go back to the house. There aren't any fish here. I said, son, you have to be patient. Sometimes it takes the fish a while to get there. And so he waited for another 10 minutes and then said, look, I have been patient and still no fish. And after another five minutes went by, he turned to me and said, the fish aren't biting my line because they know that I'm not from Spanish Wells, that I'm from Kentucky. Just then, at that very second, something took the bait and was off. He snagged it. And when he pulled it in, it was a nice-sized grouper about that big. Immediately, his whole countenance changed. He got excited. And when he pulled it on the dock, he took it and ran up to his mom, who was in the men's at the time. He was really excited, just catching that one fish, though he released it. His feelings would turn from frustration and a sense of failure into joy, delight, and excitement. He had caught a fish. Now, early the next morning, after a fishless night, someone is seen standing at the shore. He was the risen Lord, but his disciples did not recognize the person standing there. And he had come to seek them. He knew where they were. He knew what they were experiencing, the feelings that they were grappling with. And just as he sought them before, so he now seeks them again. Do you know that that is the message of Scripture? From the book of Genesis all the way through Revelation, it's the message, the portrait of a God who is seeking, who is searching, who is questing for humanity. It began all the way back in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve had, fell, had fallen. And he came seeking them. And we see him over and over again, reaching out 
and seeking for humanity. Following his resurrection, we see our Lord seeking and searching for those who needed his special grace, his care, his blessing, his attention, and his encouragement. He sought Peter in his despair after having denied him on Thursday evening. He sought the two disciples on the road to Emmaus in their disappointment and discouragement. He sought Thomas in his doubt, and now he seeks the seven disciples in the Sea of Galilee. And during his ministry, we see him again seeking a lonely Samaritan woman who had gone to Jacob's well to draw some water in the heat of the noonday sun. We see him seeking and reaching out to two hated tax collectors, Matthew and Zacchaeus. And he continues to seek humanity as a shepherd seeks a lost sheep. And in that trilogy of parables in Luke chapter 15, you recall, he speaks about the shepherd who leaves the 99 in a place of security and he goes and seeks after that one lost sheep. Then we see the woman who had the 10 silver coins and she lost one. And she turns the house upside down as she seeks to find that one lost coin. And in the parable of the prodigal son, we see the father reaching out and seeking the son who had gone to the distant land. So here we see our Lord seeking his disciples at the Sea of Galilee. The song says, in tenderness he sought me. Weary and lost and worn. And on his shoulders he brought me into his fold again. While angels in his presence sang until the courts of heaven rang. All the love that sought you and me. All the blood that bought me. All the grace that brought us to the fold. Wondrous grace that brought us to the fall. He continues on that mission of seeking and searching yet today. For he has come to seek that which was lost. So firstly we see the risen Christ sought his disciples. But secondly I want you to notice the risen Christ spoke to his disciples. He spoke to them. Following that very tiring and exhausting night, which yielded absolutely nothing, the disciples were getting ready to return to shore. Jesus, whom they did not recognize, stood on the shore and said to them, spoke to them with these words, Children! Do you have any meat? The NIV says, Friends, do you have any fish? The reply, No, we haven't caught a sardine. After having cast our nets all night, we caught nothing. You can almost hear the sense of discouragement in their response. Our efforts seem to have been futile. We've caught nothing. Then in verse 6, Jesus said to them, Throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some fish. At that moment, they must have thought, Who is this speaking? We have been dunking these nets all night. Is this some kind of a trick? 
Is this a hoax? We've been unsuccessful so far, having fished all night. What makes you think we can catch fish this time around? It's already daybreak, in fact. But in spite of their doubts and fears, they listened to the voice that spoke and were amazed by the result. For verse 6 tells us, when they cast the net on the right side of the boat, they were unable to haul it in because of the large catch of fish, some 153 fish. You can only imagine the look of surprise and amazement on the faces of these disciples when they saw the catch. Where did this abundance of fish come from? Similar to the abundance in the feeding of the 5,000. Or the abundance which took place at the marriage of Cana of Galilee. A miracle must have taken place indeed. A power greater than ours and nature's is at work here. What the voice said to them did not make a lot of sense. But they did it and were surprised by the result. The marriage feast at Cain of Galilee when they ran out of wine. Mary went to Jesus and explained the situation to him. And then she went back to the servants and said to them, Whatsoever he says to you, do it. And when they did, they had the best wine that they had ever tasted. You know, there are times when he speaks to us and his word goes against our human thinking, our human thought. It goes against the grain. Or that which appears to be sensible or normal. But if we hear and heed that word, he will indeed show himself strong on our behalf. And do far more than we can imagine or expect. John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, now recognized the voice and the person behind the miraculous catch. He then said to Peter, Peter, it's the Lord, it's the Lord, the risen Christ. The one behind this miracle. And no doubt after the disciples saw this miracle, their faith in the risen Christ was renewed. He was indeed alive. You know, often in our moments of failure or discouragement or doubt or when we feel a sense of inadequacy and not up to the task, Christ comes to us with fresh grace, with fresh power, with fresh blessing and fresh encouragement and fresh strength and gives us that little nudge that allows us to go on and to continue in the task before us. And that's exactly what he does for these disciples. Through that miracle, their faith in Christ was renewed. And they were now able to go on to the next phase of life. He is still here this morning speaking to us, renewing our trust, renewing our faith, uplifting us, encouraging us, leading us on as we face sometimes a future that seems fraught. 
with challenges and difficulties. So the risen Christ sought them. He went to where they are. He knew exactly all that they were going through. And he left Jerusalem just to seek them out. Secondly, the risen Christ spoke to them. Friends, do you have any fish? No, we have toiled all day, all night, and have caught absolutely nothing. Throw your net to the right side of the boat, and you will catch some fish. Finally, this morning, I want you to notice with me, the risen Christ supped, dined with the disciples. As the disciples were bringing the boat with the fish to shore, they saw a fire of coals with fish and bread on that. And our secretary, Crystal, tried to sort of capture that pictorially for us this morning. Jesus then said to them, Bring some fish to me that you have just caught. And at that moment, Peter climbed aboard the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, as we said, 153. This was no small catch of fish. Jesus then gave his disciples an invitation to come and to have breakfast to dine with him and to meet to eat the meal already prepared. Now about two weeks earlier Jesus had dined with the disciples for the last time before he went out to face the cross. You recall he was in the upper room with them and they celebrated the Passover meal together. That was a time of tears. A time of sadness, as he told them what would soon happen to him. But this meal here at the shore of Galilee was one of joy and celebration, which he personally prepared for them. And on previous occasions, Jesus had come and then he had suddenly disappeared. But notice now, he lingers with them, he communes with them, he dines with them, he sups with them. There was fellowship. There was conversation. He stayed right there with them, and they enjoyed his presence. As he served them, broiled fish and bread. What a meal that must have been. We have here, I believe, a portrait of the kind of communion and fellowship and spiritual interaction that Jesus desires to have with us, his people. In Revelation 3.20, we read these words, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and notice, I will sup with that one. I will commune. I will dine with such a one. And he or she with me. And in our Old Testament lesson read for us by Mrs. Wilkerson, from my there, we read these words. He has prepared a feast of good things for us. The Lord Almighty has prepared a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats, and the finest of wines. And we can sup and dine with him through the means of grace, through his word, through our own private times of communion through meditation, through worship, and through fellowship. And that's what we're doing today as we have gathered as the people of God. We are supping with him in his presence through our fellowship and through our worship 
together. I close with these words from the gospel song, Come and Dine. Jesus has the table spread where the saints of God are fed. He invites his chosen people, come and dine. With his manna he doth feed and supply our every need. Oh, it is sweet to walk with Jesus all the time. In the chorus, come and dine. The master calleth, come and dine. We may feast at Jesus' table all the time. He who fed the multitude turned the water into wine. To the hungry, to the weary, to the discouraged, he calls, come and dine. There on the Sea of Galilee, he sought his disciples. He spoke a word of admonition to them. And then he dined, he supped, and fellowship with them around the table of bread and fish. Let's pray. And so, Lord, we have come to the conclusion of this time of worship this morning. We thank you that you have received every aspect of our service today. We pray that something from your word will be a source of encouragement and blessing and help to some individual this morning who may be at that place where your disciples were when you sought for them when you spoke to them and when you commune with them as we prepare now to leave this your house of worship we know that we shall not depart from your presence for your word reminds us that you're with us always for those this morning known to us who still need the ministry of your spirit who still need the wellness of your grace in their lives, who still need to know that you are with them in this time of challenge. May they know that they're being remembered today and that they're being uplifted by the prayers and thoughts of brothers and sisters in faith. Minister in a special way to each one of them this morning, in the name of Jesus, your Son, we pray. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Lightman, for that challenging message. We're not on the beach this morning to have breakfast, but we have been fed in this sanctuary. And for all of those who have been listening, we have been fed today. We've been equipped to go forth in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's turn now to number 157. 157, Jesus calls us o'er the tumult of our life's wild, restless sea. Jesus calls us o'er the tumult of our life's wild, restless sea. Day by day his sweet voice sounded, saying, Christian, follow me. As our old apostles heard it by the
joys and in our sorrows, days of toil and hours of peace, silly calls with pains and pleasures that we love him more than these. Jesus calls us by thy mercy, Before we have our mission statement, I left this to the end so no one would forget. I need to see those persons who sent in applications for the Sir Derwood and Lady Holly Knowles scholarship. I need to see you at the front after service. If your parents are here, please let them come with you, okay? Let's say our mission statement. To worship God joyfully Offer Christ faithfully, promote growth hopefully, serve others lovingly. Please receive now the benediction. And now as you go on your way, this glorious, beautiful Lord's Day, may the angels of God lead you May God's peace accompany you. May God's abundant grace go before you. May love and light surround you. May kindness and peace spread from you. May goodness and love follow you. May family and friends support and strengthen you. And may God Almighty, the one who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, blessed and be with you, protect and provide for you, guide and guard you this day and all the days of our pilgrimage here on earth. And all of Christ's people said, Amen. Amen.